Hello and uh, welcome to the first in the FY1 uh, radiology tutorial from IR Juniors and Mind the Bleep. Hopefully everyone can hear us okay. Um, I'm just going to turn off this in case there's a bit of an echo. I'm going to hand over to Sachin. Um, hopefully people are able to join in. I think there's a few numbers popping up on the on the YouTube that I can see here now. So Sachin, if you want to take it away and we'll let people filter into the room. Sachin, I can't hear you there, so maybe just try your mic and see if it's... Hi, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we'll get you to start oh, again. Thank you very much. So hi, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Sachin, and I'm currently one of the members of IR Juniors. Um, and this is the first part of our series, Radiology for FY1s. Um, where we're aiming to give you a bit more information about what, what is expected uh, when you start working as an FY1 and are liaising with the radiology department. Um, just to give you a bit of background about who we are and what we're trying to achieve as a group. So as I said, we're called IR Juniors. Uh, we started up about two years ago now uh, with the aim of raising awareness of interventional radiology. Um, as we found as medical students, the exposure to IR was very minimal. Um, so what we've been trying to do is just raise awareness of applying into radiology and also applying for interventional radiology and how you go along into that career path. Um, we've been hosting different webinars about um, IR and the types of procedures that IR do um, and have also um, created research opportunities for uh, people to get involved in and students to get involved in as well. Alongside that, we've also tried to raise awareness of various uh, global opportunities to get involved in IR, such as elective opportunities as well. So please do check out our website, which has more information on all of these aspects that I've just discussed. Um, and these are just a few examples of some of the things that we've hosted over the last couple of years and some of the things that we're looking to also get into in the next few months and years. Um, so one of the big things we've done is uh, radiology applications. Last year, we held applications, um, so discussing portfolios, the MSRA, interviews, and choosing a training scheme, so that if you're looking to apply for radiology, that might be something um, worthwhile checking into, and we'll be hosting that again over the, over the coming months. Um, we've also been hosting an interventional radiology journal club, um, and as this is the event that we're going to be discussing today, and on our website, there'll be a link to um, various um, taste IR, uh, sessions which were basically more in-depth uh, IR discussions about the procedures that um, IRs perform. So that's just a summary of some of the things we've been doing and of course today this is what we'll be discussing uh, and we've got two great speakers, um, Dr Niall Burke uh, who's an F1 in London at the moment and we've also got a Dr Matt Brackey who is a radiology registrar up in Edinburgh. So we've got two uh, really interested and keen speakers um, and the main thing that we'll be discussing is liaising with the radiology department uh, and kind of what you'll need to know in the first few months and year as an F1. Uh, and this is the first part of the series. Um, so uh, the main things we'll be covering in this session are communicating with the radiology department, how to protocol scans, uh, transferring images, different scan modalities and types and CT imaging. Uh, and these are the two speakers that I've just mentioned here. And then the second session will be in a couple of weeks, which will be an introduction to IR uh, and how IR will feature as, uh, as, as you are an FY1 and, and kind of the, the areas that it will crop up in. And then there'll also be a section on common radiology cases. Um, and this is the collaboration that this series has taken place with. So I'm from IR Juniors. The other side of things is with Mind the Bleep. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard of Mind the Bleep. It's a, a really um, useful and growing um, society. Uh, and this is the website where you can find lots of information, which has loads of FY1 related content and other advice for junior doctors. So definitely worth checking out as you start F1 uh, and get involved. 
Uh, and just a little bit more information about our recent upcoming events. We've got the next part of our journal club, which will be on the 26th of July. Um, so please do check that out um, on our website. Uh, and then the second part of this series will be on the 2nd of August uh, at around 7 p.m. as well. So um, that's pretty much everything from me. Uh, at the end of the session, if you can um, fill out some feedback, that would be amazing. Thanks very much. Uh, and I'll hand over to Niall now. Uh, thanks very much, Sachin. Um, I'm just going to light up, load up my slides. Just let me know if you can see everything okay once these pop up. I think we've, from what I can see, they're, they're popped up there. Um, so I'm going to firstly apologize for a little bit of a mix up with the streams there the the one that was initially on our youtube channel on the ir juniors youtube channel um it didn't seem to link the stream to that but we are live obviously on the youtube channel anyone who's watching us now has found us and i put the link in the in the other stream as well so if you know anyone who's who's trying to attend this just send them on the the link for the current stream that you're watching and we'll post it on our social medias as well so thank you very much uh Sasha, for asking myself to to speak today um i've asked matt brackey who's a he's a st1 radiology trainee as well in uh, in edinburgh uh, to come along and he, he, he'll obviously give some, some useful input as, as we move through these different sections and towards the end if anyone has any questions uh, Matt will be very useful to, to answer those questions as well so I'll, I'll let Matt pop on and just say a quick hello to everyone as well. Hello everyone yeah thanks very much um, Sasha and, and Niall for having me and um, yeah as I say I can't take too much credit for the, the effort and work that's gone into it um, Sasha and Niall have, have done a great job but i um, happy to to support in any way and answer any questions that I can uh, being a year into, into radiology training. So yeah, looking forward to it. Perfect. So I might, as, as we go through, if there's, if you want to kind of put in uh, ask or make any points or comments, or I might defer to you as we go through if there's anything else. So here we go. Great. Um, try and actually make this work though. Perfect. So the idea behind this talk and this talk series is essentially to give uh, incoming FY1 doctors, uh, so first year doctors in the UK, a bit of an insight into what's involved with dealing with the radiology department in those first few months once you start. Um, so this talk is going to there's going to be a bit of a radiology review, uh, just some of the, the real basics of the different types of modalities that you, you may come across and, and refer patients for. Uh, a little bit about kind of considerations when you're referring patients for different scans. Going to have a chat around CT because I think that's, it's obviously a very common modality and one you'll be referring patients for quite a bit, but there's a little bit of confusion often. And even myself, I, I found, you know, it, it was only after a few months of FY1 that you actually start to, to figure out you know, the different protocols and that as well. Not that you necessarily need to have an in-depth understanding, but it is useful as, as you kind of have the discussions with radiology. We're going to talk about making radiology requests as well um, and how, how to con conduct yourself when you're doing those, uh, doing those discussions. Going to, as Sachin said, there is a second part of this uh, talk, which will focus more on interventional radiology, but there is uh, some cases that I work through as I uh, go through this talk, and one of them is related to IR, so I, I just left that in. And there's some interactive cases and activities as we go through as well. Um, so the Slido, which um, feel free, I'm going to keep an eye on it on the other screen here. If anyone has any questions as we go along, um, the, uh, the QR code is there to have a look at uh, and scan. And then there's also the, um, I I'll put up a few polls as we go along to keep it a little bit interactive, hopefully. And that's the code as well. Perfect. So just to let you know what isn't in this talk and things that might be useful as you go through the next year will be things like chest X-ray interpretation, MSK X-ray interpretation, basic CT stuff, and CV building for anyone who's particularly interested in radiology and IR. And that's, you know, particularly on the last point, that's, uh, you know, there's a, IR juniors itself has a, a lot of resources from that point of view if you want those. But there will be opportunities, I'm sure, and a lot of you are just post-finals. So actually your chest and MSK interpretation is probably better than a lot of ours at the moment. Uh, and as I said, there are no stupid questions here. Um, this is, you know, for your benefit to make you feel more comfortable as you start your new job. So do, please do ask those in the Slido. 
So a rapid radiology review is just kind of to run through some of the modalities that you may come across uh, quite early on or you will come across. So, uh, you know, this is essentially a plain film uh, x-ray of a wrist showing a green stick fracture. You know, usually if this was live, I'd get a little bit of interaction. Fluoroscopy is also quite common, one that you refer patients for quite a bit when you're on uh, surgical attachments, different types of barium swallows or water soluble contrast swallows. Ultrasound, obviously, as well, is, is quite common. Uh, CT. So this is going to be our first point of interaction. So hopefully we'll actually make this one work. So do try and give this a go. So if you're on your Slido there, um, which the details should pop up here now. Uh, so if you want to get onto the Slido, I'm going to release the first poll. So it's essentially just to have a, a look at this scan and don't cheat by looking up the Radiopedia ID, which will give you all the answers, but just to, to see what, what you think is going on here with the CT scan, C, CT brain. Okay, we've got so we've got a few people interacting, which is good. There may be more than one right answer. Hopefully, you can select more than one answer. I'm just going to give it another ten or fifteen seconds. And we'll leave it at that. So we've got a, a good range of answers there. Essentially what's going on here is on the patient's left side, there is a dense artery sign, which I should be able to highlight with my uh, cursor here. You've got this whole area of hypoattenuation in the MCA territory. And then there's this thing called the insular ribbon sign. So it's the loss of the white and gray matter differentiation. These are things that, you know, you don't need to get too bogged down about know, knowing. And But if you are referring a patient with, with stroke uh, signs and symptoms for a CT scan, it's, it's useful to go back and not just look at the report, but have a look at the imaging too. This is an MR venogram, uh, a PET CT here showing a renal mass. So these, I guess, are all types of examinations that I've referred patients for over my first year as, a, as an FY1. And this is a DSA, so a digital subtraction angiography um, image. And I don't know if anyone wants to have a quick think about what that might be but it is a fibroid embolization. So that's a large fibroid there. This is the catheter working its way up and around. So an up and over technique and the contrast dye has been injected into the, into the fibroid to embolize it and take away its blood supply essentially. So I think the main point from having a quick run through a lot of those is that when you look at different types of imaging, you can often be quite intimidated by them, but there's, you know, if, if you kind of stick with some basic principles, it's quite easy to figure out both, you know, what, what anatomy relates to other anatomy in the area. Um, when you're looking at different, we'll talk about CT scans in a moment as well. When you're looking at contrast enhanced scans, looking at what, what actual organs are enhanced and what, what vessels are highlighted can help you figure out what kind of a protocol was used. So it's just, just useful as you go, go through the next few months just to have a look at some of the imaging and try and figure that out. So an important point to be aware of, and often if you're you're probably all doing your your pre -hos, pre starting hospital um, mandatory online learning, some most places will make you do some ERMA as well. So radiation protection is quite important, particularly when you're referring patients for ionizing radiation scans or scans involving ionizing radiation. And this ERMA is the is the legislation and regulations which kind of guard the the exposure to ionizing radiation in this uh, in this setting so the main things are it's, it's just that when you're ordering a scan on a patient you have to make sure that it's the right patient obviously um it pregnancy status particularly because you know the the fetus is at a higher risk of of DNA damage through um, ex from exposure to ionizing radiation and breastfeeding status is particularly important for nuclear medicine scans uh, you also want to reduce any, any accidental or unintended doses to patients, as it says there. So your job as the FY1 referring patients to these scans is to give enough information to the 
to the people who are vetting the scans in order to justify the exposure. Um, so it can be, you know, ward rounds are busy and oftentimes through the day you're, you'll have a massive jobs as it can be very tempting to just put two or three words in a, in a referral. Um, but actually, you know, you're less like that let, scan is less likely to be done. And then that will impact potentially on patient care if it is an actual, you know, scan that needs to be done because the, the practitioner can't actually justify the scan based on the information you've given. And I think something else which I perhaps didn't completely fathom, I couldn't fathom was how could you order a scan on the wrong patient? Um, and it, it's amazing when you particularly, I guess, over the, the, the winter months there when, you know, we had lots of wards full of patients with COVID, um, a lot of the, there was a lot of similarities um, between your patient demographics and, and a lot of them needed different types of scans, for example, CTPAs. And um, when you're in a rush and you've, you know, got, got a lot of jobs to do, it can can happen and has happened to people. So it's just important to always make sure that when you're finally clicking through that um, order or that request at the end, that there is a, that you're assured that it's the right patient that it's being carried out on. So these are the important radiology risk assessments that I go through when I'm, um, when I'm referring patients for scans. So if it's ionizing radiation, so x-rays, CTs, uh, I, interventional radiology procedures, PET-CT scans, nuclear medicine, all that, you want to make sure that it's the right patient and the, pa and the patient isn't pregnant. The stochastic effects are particularly important if you have a younger patient. So trying to avoid CT scans where possible in younger patients and, and thinking about other uh, modalities such as ultrasound and MRI, which may be useful. And, and if you're not sure, ask your team. And that's, that's, that's one of the main points I want you to take away from this evening. With MRI, um, obviously it's a, a, a big magnet. So the brain, previous brain surgery interventions, if they have any cardiac devices, particularly pacemakers, you want to be aware of that. So if you're on a ward round and the consultant is, is kind of says, oh, we, we could do it getting this patient an MRI, could you order that today or request that today? Um, it's worth taking th that few seconds and it'll speed you up later to be to quickly run through these things to be like you know any previous brain surgery or any pacemakers or cardiac devices or any metal implants or foreign bodies in your you know and and just run through that and it could save you time down down the line contrast also so contrast used in commonly in ct fluoroscopy and interventional radiology procedures and it's an important role that you play as well if you're referring patients for these scans to make sure that you have a look at their kidney function um, and you know if 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 it's if if there's any issues with that you know or if you're not sure again ask your team you want to decrease the risk of contrast nephropathy and that's often done with you know pre and post hydration also allergies to contrast media if a patient discloses that to you or sometimes there's a bit of a crossover with shelf allergies as well um, so there's just some points um, so just going to come on to case one, um, which is, I've tried to make this as real life as possible, I guess, in that there's a handover at the top of the, the slide here, which tells you about this 34 year old patient who's come in with some abdominal pain, vomiting, and they have a tender mass at the right iliac fossa. So the team's working uh, diagnosis at the moment is appendicitis. The patient was sent for an ultrasound, which they couldn't see an appendix, but they did see some sort of a mass that was lateral to the, to the uterus and there was some fluid as well. Um, quick look at the bloods. I think the important thing here is that to realize as an F1, you're going to be faced with a lot of information and some of it's relevant, some of it's not so much, but it's always going to be there in front of you. So it's about extracting the most important points. So we've done an ultrasound abdomen here. Um, this is a, a relatively young patient, 34 years old. I'm going to throw up the next one now and see if you think what is the next, in your opinion, what is the next best imaging option for this patient? There's obviously a few options, but just, just see what you, you think here. So... And that's the slider there again, if anyone needs to rejoin it. There is a slight delay here, um, so I'm going to show the correct answer. 
from my point of view here. There is, obviously there's some argument about there could be some argument about this one. Um, if the patient is, we don't have all the information here. Essentially, if the patient is stable, um, and would be able to kind of get to the ultrasound department for a transvaginal scan. So that was the TV ultrasound scan. Um, that could be quite useful here um, in, in the sense that we haven't completely ruled out a gynecological cause for this. And doing a transvaginal scan will get you better uh, resolution and visualization of the, the uh, uterus and ovaries. So that is, is a potential here. Um, the other one, as a lot of people went for the CT scan there, which is potentially very appropriate and potentially something that, you know, could happen in this in this setting. Um, I think there's, you know, we, we don't have the full picture here and other parts of the history and investigations will be useful. Hopefully you've been thinking about that along the way. Um, would be obviously a full gynae history from this patient. Um, I'm going to tell you now that was, that may not have been clear, but this was, if it is a female, you want to get a gynae history. Um, and the history re bowels opening, any past surgical history. I know it says no past medical history, but asking patients if they've had any uh, intra-abdominal surgery before um, ruling out any cardinal features of any obstruction. Because in that, in that, in that case, if you were suspecting that there may be an obstruction, then as, as some people voted for there, an abdominal film may well be useful if there's um, a consideration around obstruction. But otherwise, in these settings, I think not, not very useful. So just going to come back to radiology workflow for a few moments. Um, radiologist versus a radiographer, um, which is something that uh, surprisingly still, um, you know, even a few months, you know, six, eight months into FY1, people didn't understand. And I guess it's, you know, it's a department in and of itself operates quite independently. And it's understandable, obviously, that people don't know the difference. A radiologist is essentially a doctor who's gone on to do further training in radiology. And, and obviously, Matt, for, for, as an example, is now ST1 radiology trainee. Um, a radiographer, it's also a degree course, um, but you can kind of go into it straight out of uh, school. Um, and it's more about image acquisition um, and all those things I mentioned before. So justifies, just justifying scans, optimizing the scans, and obviously the patient care and contact side is, is a very important role for the radiographer as well. There are extended roles for radiographers, so sonographers and also some reporting radiographers will, will report on, on scans as well. So just the next point is, this is something that will often happen at handover. You'll be told that we ordered a CT scan overnight for this patient. Can you make sure it gets done? So the scan is kind of ordered, but non-urgently. And trying to figure out, I guess, the logistics of how do you then bring that scan forward and um, get it done. I guess the, the important thing is you want to make sure that the scan was ordered on the right patient and, and clarify that with, with the colleague who's handed this over. Um, so there's just two pictures of a radiographer and a radiologist. Uh, who is the hot reporting radiologist and who's the hot seat radio, radiology registrar? So these are two important um, two important people to know and it may vary slightly obviously depending on what hospital that you get into the hot seat radiology registrar is the person that you're going to have most of your discussions with with regard to referring patients for imaging um so they will you put through the the scan request and have a have a discussion with the radiology registrar about you know whether that's the most appropriate scan and why it's needed and obviously prioritizing around the list um so in this case, a scan was ordered overnight. You want to talk to the, the hot seat radiology registrar who can help you out with that. The hot, the hot reporting radiologist. So this can be the same person or be a completely different uh, radiology registrar or consultant who will be hot reporting scans as they're done in, in ED. Um, so if you have any questions or queries as you go through um, it, while you're dealing with patients and you want to kind of get, get you know, uh, advice or a, a, an opinion on a scan, it will be the hot reporting radiologist you'll have a chat with. So as I said, the scans are, are vetted by the hot seat uh, radiology registrar usually. Um, uh, and then once they're vetted, that often isn't the last point in the process. You then need to talk to the CT radiographers as well in your, in your hospital to make sure that that patient is put on the porters list to be brought down, or uh, usually these patients will need to go on a bed or a chair to get to the department. This is a little bit different for general x-rays like chest uh, chest x-rays, abdominal films and MSK stuff. Usually you can talk straight to the radiographers on the general floor who you can call directly and, and um, again, provided you've given enough information to justify the scan, they can do that for you. Um, ultrasound scans, uh, so that this is 
kind of uh, will vary a little bit depending on what department you're in and might pop over to Matt in a minute just to get his his thoughts on, on this uh, side of things. So it's usually the sonographers or the the, the radiology registrar who's, who's working in ultrasound for that day who will uh, vet your scans. And MRI scans are usually by a consultant radiologist who, if you kind of will contact the, the hot seat radiology registrar, they'll be able to put you in contact with them or, or they can kind of liaise with that consultant for you. So Matt, I, I don't know if there's, if there's anything in that that you want to add to or whether you're... I think, I think exa exactly as you said, Niall, that it is going to vary um, in depending on which hospital you're at. And I think it's a good idea. I mean, during your foundation year um, rotations, you will probably do a job at a district general hospital you'll probably do a job at a, one of the, the major hospitals in the city that you're working in. And, um, you know, if in doubt, ask either ask the, the ward staff who have worked there for a long time or the red, or don't be shy to get in touch with the radiology department about how this works, because yes, it, overall, I think that that's a very good summary of how, how, how it will work. Um, in my, in my hospital, for example, that I'm at at the moment in, in the, the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, which is a, a major center there. Um, there are four inpatient radiologists, two consultants, two red, uh, registrars who are sort of vetting, reporting all in one go. And we're, we're sort of next door to the radiographers. So it all works as one big ship. Um, but that's, that's a very busy hospital, you know, with it recovering a large area. Whereas in a smaller hospital, for example, a, a district general hospital, there might be one radiologist calling all of the shots. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's really just a case of... Um, don't be shy to get in touch with the radiology department to find out how that works. Um, if you are in doubt, if you're worried about a patient, call us, ask us if there's a particular, you know, if you're in a big hospital and you order a scan that's really urgent, um, a radiologist might not see that report straight away, um, request straight away, particularly if they are, um, you know, very busy. So don't be shy to, to have a discussion um, with the radiologist to, to, to alert them to that um, and, we, and, and also the radiographers as well. Yeah, yes, for ultrasound, um, again, my experience only working in two hospitals so far in, in, in one area. Um, yeah, the, between the registrars and the consultants will get a get the pile of requests for ultrasound and, and sort of vet them um, per day. And obviously we have outpatients to vet as well. So um, it depends. But if you are very worried about a patient, I, I wouldn't um, hesitate to, to get in touch or at least speak to the senior members of your team on the ward to, to find out how it how it normally works and um, yeah MRI scans exactly this is it tends to be a consultant radiologist I think in most places that's in charge of MRI for that morning or afternoon say um, and you know sometimes if we get a call if I'm on inpatient CT um, asking to discuss some MRI I can speak to the MRI consultant who's probably you know a few doors down from me and um, so um, again, it's it, it's hard to put a, a hard answer on this because it's going to vary so much between between hospitals. But that that's a gem. That is basically how it works as a general rule. And yeah, don't don't be shy to to find out when you move to a new hospital what, um, you know, speak to the radiology department to find out how these things work. That's great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I think the the. The points obviously that were made there um very useful i have just noticed that there were two questions that i was looking at the polls rather than the q a um so the pregnancy test in that case we chatted about earlier on would have been very useful and i guess the, you know uh, purposely didn't give a lot of information there how would previous brain surgeries affect mri use particularly if there was a uh, previous coiling so kind of interventional neuroradiology treatment or, or clipping i guess of, of aneurysms there's, you know, often a little bit of, of metal left in there. So that's just a discussion that will have to um, be had with the MRI radiographers and the consultants where necessary. But I, I, that's that that was that point. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I guess at the, the start of this introduction, I didn't mention that I was um, previously a radiographer. Uh, so that 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 is why I guess the, the logistical side of the radiology department was something that I had a bit of an insight into before uh, before starting medicine. So image transfer, this is something that we were just asked to pop in as well. Another logistical point that you may not um, be aware of or, or think uh, that much about before you're actually on the job. Um, so it's not uncommon to have a patient transferred from one hospital to another, particularly if you're working at a tertiary center, which you may be in the next two years. Um, so when these patients come across, 
uh, you know, unless you're in Scotland where they've got the, the whole of Scotland connected up together in a pack system, which is, which is great. Um, their imaging may not come automatically with them. So there is, um, this system called PAX, essentially the picture archiving and communication system, which is uh, used to locally store images and make them available for viewing. So transferring images or kind of liaising with the radiology department to transfer images is an important uh, job because it can avoid patients having multiple scans, which, which can involve ionizing radiation. Um, and double dose of that obviously is, is something if you can avoid, you'd want to do that. And also it provides the teams looking after the patient and the radiology department with these important reference images if they're then getting further scans so that they, they have some sort of a baseline or previous imaging to review. So there's usually a PAC specialist radiographer who works in, in these departments who uh, they usually have a fairly accessible email or you can call them as well to organize these PACs transfer, transfers. Um, the important things to have to hand in, in if you were asked to do these things is the hospital that you want the images transferred from, uh, the specific dates if available, and also if there's any individual scans that you know are particularly important and you want to get transferred across as well, they'd be the, the things I'd recommend having to hand. Mobile x-rays, so you may have seen as your, while, while medical students are, you know, on your shadowing blocks that it, it does happen sometimes that we need to get the radiographers to come up to the department or up to the ward to, to do mobile chest x-rays in particular for patients. Um, and there can be a little bit of a battle, and I've, I've been on the other side of these telephone calls quite a bit, um, uh, chatting uh, with, with junior doctors who, who want uh, chest x-rays done on the wards. Um, and, and it can seem like the radiographers are being quite difficult, but essentially their job is to make sure that they're not unnecessarily going up to a ward and using x-rays in an unprotected environment and potentially exposing other people in, in that ward to that ionizing radiation. It can also be quite difficult in those external environments on a ward to actually get the best imaging that, you know, that is, is required. So in order to optimize the scans, these are if at all possible, better done in the department. So if you are requesting a mobile x-ray, do ask yourself is if, if this needs to be done now and if it's going to change patient management. If, if it does and that the, you, the answer to that question is yes, then absolutely go ahead. Uh, and it, you know, ask yourself, is this patient clearly too unstable to go down or you know, could they go down with a nurse escort uh, to the radiology department to have their x-ray done, for example? And if, there's a, if you're not sure about the answers to those questions, senior nurses or obviously other members of your team are great people to talk to about that. And there's obviously very clear examples of when we'll be doing portable chest x-rays, ICU resource patients. If you have somebody really deteriorate on the ward and they're not stable enough to go down, recovery and theater chest x-rays if pa patients are getting lines put in and they want to obviously get imaging on the spot in case there's any need for repositioning. Um, beyond chest x-rays, it's, it's quite rare to get other mobile exams done on the ward very rarely depending on you know very specific circumstances where it'll often have to go through the, the radiologists on call um it may be possible to get other scans done but that that's obviously on a case-by-case -case, um uh, situation or scenario so some final insider tips on this section before we move on is that you know radiology potentially does have a, a reputation or radiologists that you know the there can be some difficulty in having these conversations. And that may be something that you've seen, um, you know, your, your the FY ones that you've been shadowing talk about. But I think it's important that although there are some personality traits that persist, I think there is a, you know, a new generation of radiologists now who are very clinical and very approachable. And, and that's de definitely the, 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 the part to focus on. Uh, I've said it myself, and I make this mistake all the time when you're, you know, requesting a scan rather than ordering a scan. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's just a turn of phrase, but you, the radiology department and radiographers don't want to be ordered to do anything. Um, it's more, it, you know, just, just try and get into the habit of using that, that terminology. Um, you know, at the start of your discussion, you know, when you're on the phone to the radiology registrar on call, um, start with, would it be okay to discuss a scan request with you if, if there's something that they don't agree with and you can't understand phrases like for my learning, for my learning is a, you know, an excellent phrase that, you know, you'll use many times over the, the next year as FY1. So uh, don't be afraid to do that. If, if you're ordering on, on an online system as often, you know, you will be, have multiple windows open with blood results, previous scans and be able to flick through those because even though you can prepare yourself um, you know, pretty well. I think sometimes having that information to hand if they want a specific data point, it's, it's useful to have it there. On the morning ward rounds, if there's multiple F1s around and there's lots of scans to be done, just kind of 
raised the, the point of would it be useful for one of us to go off and start, you know, requesting some of these scans. And really, this is the one that really bugs me is, is that when you start a conversation or start a discussion about a scan with my consultant wants a, a chest, a CT scan or whatever, um, you're now part of the clinic, you'll now be part of the clinical team, obviously. And, you know, the best interest of the patient is, you know, your priority as well. So you need to understand why this CT is required. And, you know, you have to kind of get behind the, the request as well. So, you know, and, and it will help you if, if you kind of, you know, take take a little bit of ownership of, of these uh, requests and uh, discussions rather than off, you know, off, putting it off to one side or kind of putting it on to your consultant or more senior member staff. And it does get easier. The more the more of these that you do, the, the better, the easier it'll get. So going to whiz through this section on CT scans. Um, just again, because I think it's an important area that um, you'll come across quite a bit and you can get away with not knowing an awful lot about it, but it's some, you know, some key foundation points are, are important. So first of all, we're going to look at these three different types of CT scans of the, the chest. So we've got a CTPA, a CT thorax and a CT chest with contrast. And just for a moment, take a look at those three scans and try and figure out which is which. They're not in order at all. Um, and just try and figure out if there's any kind of characteristic things on any of these um, scans, which would make you think one way or the other. And if you're watching this back, obviously you can feel free to pause. Um, we're going to start with this one here, which is the CTPA. Um, you can see the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries bilaterally are enhanced with contrast. And actually this, this one in particular shows a, quite a large um, pulmonary embolism there. Um, moving down to this one, uh, so you can see that there is some enhancements of, of the liver. Um, there's also enhancement of the, the rims here of, of the, um, the pleural cavities. This is, this is um, a empyema. Um, and you also can see that there is a little bit of contrast there as well in the aorta, showing that, you know, that there has been some contrast use. So this is a contrast enhanced CT scan. Um, this one is a high resolution CT of the thorax showing bronchiectasis. So there's a lot of kind of breakdown of the, the lung tissue here towards the bottom. And you can see that kind of train tracking appearance there of the CT. And this is, you know, beyond appreciating that which, you know, what type of scans these are, you don't need to get bogged down with the pathology itself. But the important thing to say is that th there were several cases over the, the winter where we were ordering CT PAs for patients with COVID. Uh, who also needed high resolution chests, uh, chest scans or, uh, and the important thing to say is that th the main thing that's different about this high resolution chest scan is, or, or, you know, the thorax scan is that there's different windowing used and we've just kind of focused on a, a, a certain level of the data and, and certain kind of um, how narrowed down the Hounsfield units to look at particular densities. So if you look at the CTPA, which we've just changed over there, you can get a good you know, representation of the, the lung tissue from that as well. I'm gonna defer back to Matt after we go through these three to see if he has anything to add, but uh, these different type of CT scans. So the other one that is a, quite a common one that you come across in, again in surgery is the difference between a CT abdomen, CT colonography, and a CT triple phase abdo. So again, have a look at these three scans and see if there's any kind of characteristics on those scans that you think could play, you could place um, under, I guess, any or all of these uh, criteria. And again, feel free to pause uh, to have a look at these if you're watching it back. So we'll start on the left this time. Um, so this is a non-con um, CT abdomen. Uh, so you can see essentially a lot, lots of grays, very difficult to differentiate different types of tissues here. Often for these um, scans, they may give a little bit of oral contrast in order to di differentiate the bowel a little bit from the other organs around, but there is none that we can see here, definitely. So the, you can see the aorta and the renal arteries and there's, you know, the renal vessels there, there's no enhancement at all. Moving up to this one, the aorta is um, enhanced here with contrast. So this is, is an arterial phase uh, of the abdomen. You can see the blood vessels, the, the arteries here heading out to the, the renals as well. Um, and obviously the rest of the, the blood supplies to the organs as you go along. So that's an arterial phase one. And then finally up, up on the top right, um, there is, you know, again, start 
the, where I tend to start when I'm looking at these is look at the vessels and see what they look like. So th there is some enhancement of the of the aorta here, but definitely less than the arterial phase. And you can see the liver tissue there is um, kind of enhanced and, and as have the kidneys and, and spleen there. So this is a portal venous phase scan um, and all these three together. So a non-con, an arterial phase and a portal venous is a triple phase abdo. So this is an important thing to bear in mind if you're ordering these scans, because this will necessitate the patient having three separate CT scans, um, one dose of contrast, one dose of contrast, but three exposures to ionizing radiation. So, um, you, you know, you can you can kind of often weigh up the risks and benefits of, of sending a patient for a scan and not necessarily realize that it's, a, it's going to have three, three exposures to radiation. The last one was CT colonography, which wasn't there. Um, and this shows, I don't know, hopefully you can see this okay. So there's um, dilated colon there. So there's been some air insufflated into the colon and then there's a, a 3D um, reconstruction of that as well. And finally on the CT scan side of things, um, so CT urogram, CT KUB, and a CT renal protocol. Um, and again, have a quick look at these, see if there's anything that really stands out about you know, the, the scans that would make you think about how they've been taken, that maybe some delay after the contrast was given, um, which I guess is maybe a, maybe a giveaway here. And again, pause if you want. So CT urogram. Um, We'll, what I'll do is I'll start with the non-con one. So essentially, this is the, the non-con. So that's a CTKUB. Um, you can see that this is a, um, a reconstruction of, of the CT. Um, you can see that there's a renal calculus here. And this is commonly used in the setting of uh, renal, colic, renal colic in patients. And used a lot more often now than plain film abdomens for uh, the detection of, of these uh, of, of renal calculi. Um, so no contrast use can be done on quite a low dose protocol uh, because the, the, the contrast that you want is, you know, but not, not that much. So you can essentially just have a look at the, uh, um, you know, if there's any stones in the tract. Moving on here. So this one on the left, so we can see the aorta enhanced again and the renal arteries coming off. So this is an arterial phase. Next one up, again, less enhancement of the aorta, but you can see that uh, there is a definite, definite change in the uh, appearances of the kidneys. So this is the nephrographic phase of, of, the, of, of a renal protocol scan. And finally, you can see here that there's the, the contrast now draining out of the, the renal pelvis and down into the ureters. And this would be the, the urographic phase or a CT urogram essentially. But all of these three together is, is usually what constitutes a CT renal protocol. Um, Matt, I'll bounce over to you there before we move on. I think you probably yeah. agree. It, it's it's quite a quite an easy area to get mixed up between these different scans. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And you know, I think this this slide is really useful. Um, I didn't have a clue about this as a as an FY, and you know, not not so much to be able to actually interpret the scans and report and report the scans. But although those who are interested in in radiology, as I assume quite a few of you are, it's probably a good idea to get a good head start. At you know looking what what do these things look like when we're looking at the scan but not just for a general doctor to 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 understand why we do certain scans you know to understand that certain scans will give more dose to the patient than others and um, why we do the phases that we do because ultimately this is all going to lead to the question of you know what question can this answer why am I ordering this scan? And, and that helps you, I think, as a, as a junior doctor, think about, you know, what, what question do we need answering here? Is the scan going to be useful? Do we justify, you know, the dose that we're going to give to the patient? Um, and that get, probably leads you away from, as now mentioned before, the, the, the problem of saying my, my consultant wants this scan. Um, so, you know, we're not expecting you to be able to interpret these scans yet, but but just to have this basic understanding of the different phases and, and, and why we do them in certain situations is, is a really useful tool um, to get in your mind. And especially if you're a budding radiologist, it'll set you in good stead for when you, when you do start your training. Matt, a question in there just about the triple phase CT abdos. So I, I know myself that a common indication for those would be pancre pancreatic um, kind of pathology other indications for a, a triple phase abdo having those three scans done 
Um, yeah, so I suppose it depends. So you, with, when you're looking for arterial phase, which would be the, the sort of early phase, it, that can be for, for two reasons. I suppose the very early arterial phase would be looking for um, just the blood vessels to be able to follow them down. Um, and then later on, you can, it, with the later arterial phase, you can sometimes see um, blood going into certain, for example, tumours. So a, a good example is hepatocellular carcinoma, where you get, um, you'll, you'll get the contrast going into the actual tumour itself, and then it will wash out in a late, in later phase. So if you look at the arterial phase, and you see contrast, um, in and around the tumour and then at a later phase um, in the portal venous and then sometimes you do delayed phase you will see that um, sort of disappear um, and that, that that's a good going bit of evidence for, for oh well that probably is hepatocellular carcinoma I mean that is not don't take that as as um, as red that there, there are different rules to that and obviously mm-hmm. there are other examinations for example MRI um yeah. to, to characterize lesions but but that's an example of of, of triple phase yeah and um, it, it it can give us not not only does it help us with contrast between different structures um but also can help us it gives us almost like a space and time concept of what's going on um for cancer staging so, so that that would be an example great thanks man uh, we will move on now to the next section. So these are just some common presentations. Essentially, I know we're, we're kind of running a little bit later than anticipated. So for PEs, um, there are a few scan options, chest x-rays, a CTPA, as we've discussed, and a VQ scan, uh, and rarely an MRI with an MRI, MR of the pulmonary ang- angio uh, or a pulmonary vasculature. Um, so a CTPA is generally indicated and the well score, which I do have here essentially, and most of the final meds will, will kind of have reviewed this again more recently than I have. Um, but if, if the well score is high, then a CTPA may well be indicated uh, without doing a D-dimer. Um, but, you know, if you do a D-dimer, it comes back positive, then a CTPA may be useful. Um, with regard to dis- discerning between, you know, doing a VQ scan and MR- MRPA, that, that will be discussions with radiology and obviously your consultant and not something to become bogged down with. But particularly uh, in pregnant patients, for example, that may be where you need to think about not doing a CTPA, depending on, you know, what what uh, gestation they're, the, 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 the pregnancy is at and all of that kind of stuff. And it, with regard to a chest X-ray, often these patients will have a chest X-ray if they've got any respiratory symptoms as an initial investigation anyway, just to outrule any other sinister causes for their short, shortness of breath, such as a pneumothorax or, you know, a pneumonia. Uh, so often a baseline chest X-ray will be required before patients go and have a CTPA if they haven't had one already. The acute abdomen, one of the cases that we've chatted about already had had a little bit of a discussion around this. Um, your scan options obviously are ultrasound and erect chest x-ray, which can be quite important. Um, and the patient would want to be kind of sitting up for at least 10, if not 15 minutes uh, in order to allow any intraperitoneal air to rise underneath the diaphragm. Uh, the plain film, abdominal film is, is still potentially useful if uh, m- most likely in, in cases where this obstruction suspected um but kind of wider use of the abdominal film uh, i think matt will agree has has kind of petered off mainly because cross-section imaging and and ultrasound have become that much better ct abdo um as we've chatted and an mri abdomen um so in these cases these patients will very likely go for a, a ct scan um if you know, a, 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 another diagnosis can't be reached with less invasive imaging. Um, it's, you know, obviously very sensitive for intra-abdominal uh, pathology, but the radiation dose is important. And obviously, if you have a younger patient, you might want to avoid sending them for a CT scan. Ultrasound is good, particularly in, you know, the right upper quadrant for any biliary uh, issues, renal system as well. Although we've kind of chatted about the fact that CTKUB can be more useful if renal colic is, is suspected. And we talked about that case where gynecological issues and don't um, obviously forget that sometimes transabdominal will not give you the visualization that you would get from a transvaginal scan. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, Matt, I, I'll just pop over to you one more time there on the, the acute abdomen, just on, on the point around abdominal films, just um, to maybe give people a bit of an insight about maybe how they're not used as much anymore. Yeah, I, I think again this this will vary depending on where you work in each in- institution. But I, I suppose the idea is 
whether you're going to get a CT scan anyway for a lot of the problems that you will find on an abdominal x-ray. So if you get an abdominal x-ray and it's normal, uh, sorry, if it's, and it's abnormal, um, the surgeon may want to then get a better picture um, to find before they, before they go in um, and, and operate, you know, so you might go down the ro- route of a CT scan there. And then if you get an abdominal x-ray that that's normal, it doesn't rule out that there's anything wrong there, you know, and a CT scan may end up being useful anyway. So, so for a lot of situations, yeah, an abdominal x-ray um, isn't, isn't that all that helpful with management plans. I mean, it has its role. It certainly does, for example, looking for lines, um, you know, from memory, it, sometimes looking for fecal impaction or other things. It de- depends, um, you know, I suppose it varies between different institutions, but yeah, with, with CT taking over now, um, that, that's often the case of, uh, would we get a CT scan anyway? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Matt. And just a question there about what is a VQ scan? If you haven't come across a VQ scan before, it's essentially a ventilation perfusion scan, uh, a nuclear medicine scan that's that's used sometimes in, in the detection of pulmonary emboli. Um, that's, you know, that, that's essentially as much as you need to know. Sometimes it may be indicated to do this in, in patients who... Uh, perhaps cannot have contrast or in pregnant patients in the setting of suspected pulmonary embolism. Renal colic, again, we've, we've kind of mentioned this when we went through the, the CTKUB, but CTKUB is the most accurate investigation now and is oft, often used first line. Um, as I said, the ultrasounds and, and abdominal films are less sensitive. Um, and this is some really old textbooks. You do IVUs. And I remember seeing one when I was a radiography student, uh, these kind of abdominal films with contrast in the contrast injected and, and do a plain film while the patient is lying on a, on an extra table, not, not done anymore. Uh, and th- all that information for those three was taken from the Royal College of Radiology. I refer uh, resource, which should be available no matter what hospital that you're working in the UK, there's usually an access uh, to it. If you go via the uh, a hospital network, or one of the hospital computers. And you can essentially type in um, the, the, the type of presentation that the patient has or what's suspected, and it'll give you some guidance around the best imaging. Again, the, the radiology registrars who you chat to will, will you know, also have this information to hand and will, will become adept at, at knowing what scans to, to suggest. But I think having a bit of, if you want to kind of prepare yourself really well for a discussion, having a look at this before you have a chat with the, the radiology registrar can be quite useful. And yeah, the final thing on this would be before you submit that request is just have that consideration in your own head about the information that you've put in the request versus, you know, the patient's condition, the risks of having the, the scan itself. So the ionizing radiation, if, if, if involved and actually put yourself in the seat of whoever's on the, the hot seat radiology registrar and, and think like, would, would I approve this if I was them? And, and that can be helpful. And as I say, all of these things, the way that you think about putting in scans, can be, scan requests, um, you know, it can, can lead to a more success, you know, rate with, with them being vetted in that. And I think the worst thing that happens, and it happens quite frequently is, either ill-prepared for the discussion or, you know, the, the information provided in the request wasn't there, but actually there's a patient on the ward who needs a scan done. And just because it, it wasn't kind of got across the line properly or discussed properly, it then gets rejected, the, the request. And then another member of the team has to do that. And all that time, that's time that the patient essentially is not getting that scan done. And that's, you know, these are all obvious points, but I just think it's important to think about it in the, the wider sense. Um, another case, just going to quickly run through. So essentially, this uh, is a patient who I was called to see overnight, and it was just the patient was vomiting on a surgical ward. Could you prescribe some antiemetics? Um, and the temptation in these situations is often to uh, just do what the nurses ask you to do. Um, but I, I'd hope that you'd all answer and say that that would not be what you do. Uh, thankfully, kind of got my hand over sheet and had a quick look down through it. And realized this patient was actually in for neuro observation because he had had a, a fall and a chronic subdural. And uh, essentially that, that was why he was there. So he's having these neuro obs. He'd been vomiting, didn't speak English as his first language. It was very difficult to get, a, um, a, you know, a proper history from the patient. So I felt like we had, a, had a chat with the surgical team, the surgical SHO one overnight. And we ended up referring this patient for a CT scan because of this kind of change in, in his um condition particularly the vomiting and that 
and it ended up that he'd had this isn't uh, really related to this but there was an extension of the bleed that he had previously so we then had to rediscuss with the neurosurgical team so that's just a learning point that i hope you'll take away from that is some requests that you can get when you're holding a ward cover bleep or on overnight can seem very simple but actually just think about the the uh, implications of, of not kind of reacting cannula and kidney function is something uh, important for ct scans as well um particularly ct scans i guess um and iv contrast is commonly used for these so it's important to know if your patient and you'll be asked multiple times when you're talking to the particularly the radiographers in ct if you're asking if your patient has a cannula in particularly for ctpas um because you need quite a big bolus of contrast to get up into the pulmonary artery to give you good visualization there a pink cannula is usually required um for that uh, so that's just an important thing to be aware of. Um, and as I said earlier on, oral contrast can be useful as well, particularly in CT abdomens, uh, abdomen uh, investigations in order to help differentiate some of the, the obviously the large amounts of bowel that are down there and try and see, you know, help the, the report and radio, radiologist kind of figure out what's going on. Um, so just some pictures of cannulas. Uh, kidney functions are also important in these patients and this was kind of as, as we referred to at the start so having recent use and ease and creatinine and egfr available when you're requesting the scan often if you're requesting online um on a epr or, or similar you will need to have them in the request as well so there is a contrast nephropathy risk with uh contrast which uh you know it does exist but i think the the fear around that has kind of reduced in recent years. So a lot of things with regard to kind of pre and post hydration can be considered and actually is the risk of contrast nephropathy out, outweighed by the, the chance that, you know, this scan is going to detect something that will hopefully help the patient's management in a, in a wider sense. Um, and this is just one uh, meme that came from the radiologist page essentially. And, and the, the important things that the, the, the team want to know is if there is a cannula in EGFR, um, but obviously you do have to be prepared for these, <laughs> these considerations, but when you're, when they're very busy, I imagine the, the radiology registrars just want to kind of make sure that things can kind of keep moving through the department as well. So have that information to hand. Um, so finally, I think we're going to come on to this point about putting the actual requests and discussions together. So Matt, I'll, I'll again come back to you as we move through this piece. And this is um, one of the most common things is, is you're going to be faced with is having a discussion with the radiology registrar on call about getting a scan requested. So there's a lot of different formats and different acronyms that you can use with regard to you know, the information that you need to include in a discussion with a radiologist or whoever you're referring to, if it's another specialty. The one that I commonly use, and we should all be familiar with at this stage, is just an SBAR, because trying to remember another acronym for, uh, you know, one discussion or another is only just, you end up having to Google the 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 different acronym for, you know, remembering these things. So I think if you stick with an SBAR and do it well, I don't think you'll run into too much problem. So essentially start when you, you pick up the phone and you, you call the radiology uh, registrar, so the hot seat radiology registrar, and tell them who you are, where you are, what your team is, and very basic background on the patient and why they're in, why they're in the hospital. So this is just an example of, of something that I might have said. So I'm one of the admitting F1s, just wanted to hoping to discuss the scan request. And then you kind of, then that opens up obviously the, the dialogue for further um, information. So patient who has come in with a multiple episodes of hemoptysis and hoping to get a CT thorax. So in the background section then, so you want to give, you know, if there's other major diagnosis that might be relevant to this presentation, for example, if the patient is a long-term smoker and has COPD, you might want to mention this here. Allergies, if they're important, particularly if contrast allergy, you know, you might want to mention that now. Um, and what you've done so far for the patient. So we've, you know, brought them in, stabilized them, given them some fluids. Um, and, you know, if, if it's not relevant to the case that we're kind of covering as we go through this SBAR, but do they have recent surgery? Has their condition changed since they last had a scan? Why do we need the scan now? So this lady had a COPD. She's long-term oxygen at home and she has a 40 year pack history. Um, so the assessment then is moving on to, you know, the examination, what other imaging and what bloods have come back so far. So do they have abdominal pain? Are they peritonitic if it's for a CT abdomen? Observations, how unstable are they? Are they unstable? Bloods, looking at the white cell count and inflammatory markers, or if there's a bleed suspect to talk about the hemoglobin. And then the kidney function, as I've mentioned on several occasions now, have that to hand. Um, imaging. So 
if they've recently had any other imaging that might be relevant, do have a quick look at that and the reports it, it, before you have these discussions if possible. Um, so the in this case, it would have been on examination. There's reduced right-sided air injury, um, and it shows that there's new right middle lobe collapse, um, and you know her hemoglobin is stable despite the fact that she's had the hemoptysis. The recommendation, you know, to kind of make this fit, I think what needs to sit in this is the clinical question. So what do the team want to know or what do you want to know, more importantly, about, you know, why does this scan need to be done? So is there an intra-abdominal cause for the symptoms? Is there any acute intra-abdominal abnormality or intracranial abnormality? And how, you know, in, in the context of that, how is it going to change management if this scan is or isn't done? Um, and if you're not sure that maybe a CT is the best the best scan to do or the best modality used and be clear about that and be open and just be, we're not really sure what the best thing to do we we're hoping to get some advice from radiology and they'll be more than happy to, to guide you from that point of view uh, and if you're unsure about what the clinical question is or why the scan is being done or how it's going to change management then ask your team and there's no there's no shame at all in in doing that because you know the likelihood is that you're going to get some you know key information that's going to make sure that that scan is completed if it's justified um, and that's that part so yeah we're concerned about a lung malignancy and we thought the ct thorax would help uh, to characterize the cause for him not hemoptysis and the atelectasis on our chest x-ray i think what i've come across as well in the last year is the the importance of putting the right clinical question in because these scans will be reported in the context of that clinical question and uh, you know rarely there may be things that the team the wider team wants to know that aren't then you know commented on in the report so you know, asking the question in the in the request and making sure that you're clear about what you want to know will again save time because asking somebody to go back and relook at the scan because another member of the team wanted to know this specific detail um, is obviously not not great for the patient. And this is just a kind of a, a I guess I can look back and say that it's a funny example of a, an MRI that I tried to get vetted earlier in the year. So I said I was one of the FI1s on the medical team. We had an outlier patient who was on an outlier ward and she has a diabetic foot infection and she's on IV. And before I could say anything else, the radiologist just stopped me and essentially said that, you know, telling me that this patient is, a, you know, an outlier is completely redundant information for me. And you're wasting my time telling me that part. So like I was there ready to kind of go into my S bar and I was completely cut off. So, um, you know, there's, you can, you can prepare yourself really well and, uh, you know, in the heat of the moment, maybe include some information that isn't necessarily required, but I think it was a little bit of an overreaction on the radiologist's behalf, if uh, if I do say so myself. A quick jaunt into, sorry, I'll go back actually, Matt, on that. Any any points to on the getting, you know, the discussions that you would have had with junior doctors about getting scans done? No, I think you summarised it uh, perfectly there. I just, yeah, reiterate the same, the, the main points there absolutely is, you know, what's the question we want to ask, um, answer, sorry. And then if, if we do get an answer, what, what are we going to do about it? And um, even if you just ask yourself that before you type in a request every single time, your actual, um, what you, what you type in the request will, will, will become a lot more straightforward and easier. Um, and yeah, ask, ask your clinical team or ask, um, us don't, don't be afraid to give us a call and ask if you're not sure what the right thing is to do. We are nice. I promise. Uh, thanks, Matt. So going to move on briefly, again, as I said, the second session is going to focus more on interventional radiology, but uh, we are a little bit biased, obviously, uh, in being involved with IR juniors that, you know, interventional radiology is one of the most interesting areas of modern medicine. So if you haven't considered, uh, you know, finding out a little bit more about it, please do. There's interventions now possible across multiple body systems, and the basis of most of these procedures is the Seldinger technique. So actually, you know, if you're sending a patient for an IR procedure, having an awareness of how the procedure is done is obviously quite useful as well. So usually uh, use a, a needle to get access to a vessel or a hollow organ, put a needle through that, and then you can kind of put your sheath through the needle or through the over the wire and then remove your wire. And essentially, then you have access to that, to that organ. And this uh, just gives a bit of an overview of all the different systems. This is from the Intervention Initiative um, and uh, an organization in the US um, who kind of talk about all the different examinations. So the main tips, and this will, you know, come back to the second part of the series is the main tip here, but it's, you know, go down to the IR department because in particular, um, I guess in, in being much more clinically involved and, and um, quite a modern and 
you know, forward thinking department, they're happy to see juniors come down and, and have, have a chat with them. Put in your requests first if you're sending a patient for the scan for an IR procedure so that you then have a basis to have a discussion around. And don't be afraid to ask questions um, because most people are happy to teach in this realm um, and try and come down and see some, uh, some procedures as well if you get a chance. So this is another case um, uh, that I'll have a chat about. So again, bleep goes off while you're on call, emergency surgery, F1 ward cover. Um, we've got a lady who's had a, a hemoglobin drop, drop to 50 after another PR bleed. Um, again, observations generally quite stable, but what to do next? So again, I had to refer to the, the handover. These, these, you know, as long as they're updated and kept up to date, they're, they're very useful pieces of information. So we've got a a lady in her 90s who's uh, come in with PR bleeding and fourth admission in the last month. She's got CKD4, uh, she's got a CVC, um, diverticular bleeds is what they think is going on. Uh, ultrasound yesterday, nothing. CT angio, if re bleeds. Um, so this kind of, I guess, case is to highlight the fact that we've got a lady here who's who's got a CKD of four. Um, so, you know, EGFR extremely low. Um, but in this case, obviously, she's she's had some massive bleeding and, and will probably require a CT angio, which will necessitate contrast. Um, so the, 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 the decision on whether to send this patient for that scan will have to be made in, in conjunction with, obviously, your seniors, your consultant, the radiology department, and potentially even the renal team if they're aware of this patient. So... The, you know, it's not it's not a clear cut yes or no if a patient has in stage renal failure that they won't go for a CT scan with with contrast. It's all about the the clinical picture and the context there. So again, the answer as as I'm sure you're all accustomed to from medical school is to do an ATE first of all and ask for senior help. Um, so we got got a CT scan. Um, as I said, ch chatted the radiology register and then called the CT radiographers to get the patient down. Um, there was active bleeding and then what next so this we've got now got active bleeding at the terminal ileum and we're obviously in the the ir section of this talk but the next step was you know to transfuse the patient but have a chat with the ir fellow um to see if the patient could go for a an embolization of this active bleeding site which again would necessitate more contrast but could potentially save the patient's life because you know was was bleeding so this is obviously images for, taken from an online case report uh, completely separate um but this shows the angiogram with some contrast um, leak here out of the vessels. And again, another one with some coiling in that area, um, which is kind of used to control the bleeding. So that's one of one of the cases that you may, or a similar case you may find yourself referring to IR in the future. As we come to the end, and I apologize, we're, we're running over slightly, but hopefully almost getting there. I think another thing that uh, I would have found quite useful before I started F1 was to kind of think about the jobs that are ahead of you for the day after a ward round. And this is just, you know, you can often have a ward round of, you know, 20, 30 patients um, and then have a list of jobs like this for every single one of those patients um, and trying to figure out like how to negotiate where to start is, is kind of an important one. And there's, I've, I've put a, I've put another poll here. So I'm just going to start that. Um, and I should have a link to it as well. So just to have a look at this one and just think about, where you'd rank these jobs and which which ones need to go towards the top and be done first. I think it's just good to have a have a little think about this. And I'll give you uh, 20 seconds or 30 seconds to just try and do that. Um, Matt, and with regard, to, I might just, while we're getting people to rank those a bit, I might just get uh, you back on for, for a minute. Um, with regard to vetting those scans, is there any, any other tips apart from the ones that we've just had a chat about, about like where, uh, you know, where, where you'd kind of notice people go wrong or, or, you know, could do with a little bit of advice or what you wish you knew when you were uh, uh, starting as FY1? Um. Yeah, I suppose I suppose it's so situation dependent that um, not, probably not any simple, straightforward advice regarding that. I, I think, yeah, if you, 
you have that feeling that you're worried about a patient, it's always good to escalate to, to a senior, um, whether it's in your own ward or the radiology department. But um, yeah, because there's always going to be people on the ward who, you know, who decided to go into that specialty and they, it won't be the first time that they've seen a patient with this particular presentation. So, you know, when you get to FY1, I, I would just be have a very low threshold for seeking senior advice. I, I don't know if there's any specific what what I wish I'd knew during FY1 regarding regarding get, vetting scans. I think most of the time I was just sort of requesting the scans. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a good start. But, but yeah. Grant, I'm going, I'll throw back over. Feel free to keep prioritizing the jobs there, as you see. The, there's no right answer to this uh, part of the, the session. It's essentially just to make you think a little bit more about it. But I think there's a few jobs here, particularly the and again, if you're shadowing F1s in the next few weeks before you start, the, you know, they'll they'll be able to give you a little bit of help around this. But scan, you know, scans, requesting scans and getting scans vetted is kind of a job you want to get done as early as possible in the day. Um also referrals to other specialties. So there's a few here about speaking to neurology and um referring to psych liaison. Depending on the urgency of those referrals, they also may need to be one of the first jobs that you do after uh the ward round. Um, and as I said, one of those tips that I think if, if you're in a team, oftentimes in surgical teams, there'll be maybe two or three F1s, depending on where you are, I guess, um, on a ward round. And if it's appropriate for one of you to, to peel away and, and start to do some of these jobs, that may be something you want to do. And I think people are kind of going along with that, the C, you know, CT, putting the CTPA and the CT abdomen quite high up in their prioritization there. Chasing bloods. Generally, if they're morning bloods that have been done before you go on ward round, they won't be back anyway until, you know, later in the afternoon, unless they're urgent ones. Uh, Pre-op group and save is there as well. So if, if that patient is going to go into theater in the morning, that might be something you need to, you know, try and prioritize. Um, but there are there will be jobs that you can kind of, you know, it, it can be overwhelming, but at, you'll get used to the fact that there'll be jobs that you can easily kind of put off until the afternoon and, and focus on those that are going to actually help get things done today, like a cannula in a patient who, who needs that CTPA, that, that's going to be a, you know, a, a, a point of holdback there. If the patient is called for their CTPA but doesn't have a cannula, they kind of go together. Um, and that's that's essentially what I just wanted people to have a little think about this. But, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get the hang of it, no problem, once, once you start. Matt, any, any points on that, thinking back to your foundation days? Uh, just uh, in complete agreement, I think, yeah, absolutely. Grand. So this is the one of the final activities, and there's no real, um, there's no interaction point for this, but it's just as I go down through these um, report conclusions uh, that oftentimes you might be faced with as, again, ward cover in the evenings or uh, at the weekends, you might get handed over to chase a scan, uh, chasing scan and chasing blood, blood, blood results is, you know, very, very common uh, job that you get handed over as a, a, an FY1. And it's just to think about, you know, it's not just as simple as a yes, no, chasing the scan. Oftentimes you want to know, like, what is the team's plan if this report comes back with this result or a different result? Or even if the scan is completely normal, does that mean that, you know, that's all I need to do? Or is there is there more that needs to be done? Um, so just get these to pop up. So just have a read through these as we go down through. Um, so ultrasound scan shows right-sided dilated tract with obstructing stone in the proximal ureter. Ultrasound shows multiple large cystic lesions throughout the liver parenchyma. MRCP reveals normal biliary tree, but multi-level retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, possibly in keeping with lymphoma. CTPA shows, shows subsegmental P with evidence of right heart strain. CT brain shows right-sided dense artery signs suggested of an MCA thrombus. So kind of throws back to something from earlier. CT thorax reveals thrombotic occlusion of the superior vena cava, likely related to compression from an adjacent neoplasm noted on the pre previous PET CT. Uh, CT venogram shows extensive DVT, which extends proximally as far as the left common uh, iliac vein. There appears to be compression of the left common iliac vein by the overlying right common iliac artery. I think that's the all. So essentially, just to think about if you if you were you know, the FY1 on call, and these are the reports that come back. 
um, what would you do? So look, we'll, we'll just run down through them again to finish it out. Ultrasound shows right side of dilated tract with obstructing stone, the proximal ureter. This, this sounds like hydronephrosis. Um, and depending on the patient's condition, you know, if they're quite septic, they may need, you know, uh, this definitely will need to be escalated to a more senior member of the team to see if they need a nephrostomy, for example, um, or other surgical intervention. Um, Ultrasound shows multiple large cystic lesions throughout the liver parenchyma. So on ultrasound showing multiple cysts like this, very likely the patient will need at least an MRI. Um, whether that's needed, you know, very likely will be next day, but escalating to senior about this and letting them know that there's an abnormal report would, would be useful as well. Um, the next one here, normal biliary tree, but a lot of lymphadenopathy, potentially lymphoma. So this is... Um, Again, quite quite a drastic report um, and un an unexpected one, I would say as well. So sometimes you might be waiting for an MRCP to come back um, and think, you know, there is dilatation of the biliary tree or whatever. But this is like, you know, would, would throw you off a little bit. So, you know, this would be one you might want to have a chat with the senior about, but very likely, you know, further scans and biopsies and that would be organized again in, in hours. CTPA shows a subsequental PE with evidence of right heart strain. So obviously this, this is a, a, you know, a submassive PE here. Um, and, you know, patient will very likely already be on uh, anticoagulation, but it's important to ask those questions when you're chasing a CTPA. Are they already anticoagulated? What's the plan? If there's a big PE, what are we going to do next? And a, a result like this, I think, would be one that you'd want to talk to a senior about whether they need kind of direct um, thrombolysis or, you know, that's that's going to be a more senior decision. CT brain shows a MCA thrombus. So if you're not a stroke center yourself, you may need to get this patient to a stroke center, particularly with the dense artery sign. If it's a large occlusion of a proximal vessel, they may benefit from something like stroke thrombectomy. So again, bearing in mind that, you know, trying to get an appreciation for the patient context when, when you're being asked to chase scans is important. Uh, we've got an SVCO next. So that again, you'd want to have a chat with maybe acute oncology or at least the consultant, you know, looking after them to see if you want to start steroids before they get a stent put in to, to relieve those symptoms. Um, and a CT venogram. This is quite a specific one. I don't know if, if anyone got it at home. Well done. This is a May Turner syndrome, which can cause quite an extensive um, coagulopathy of the, the lower limb on the left because of compression by the artery. So that's that. So I'll just have a quick look and see if there's any questions based on those. Nothing at the moment. And I, no acute abnormality detected. So that's an, another one you might think is important, but if the patient is unwell and the scan that's been done hasn't given a cause for that, then there may be need to escalate and actually, you know, think about what else needs to be done for this patient. So if you're chasing radiology reports, it's not just, a, as I say, a simple yes, no, you have to kind of consider about what's next. So the conclusions here are that it, it, it's hard to go wrong with your discussions with radiology if you use a, an SBAR approach. And I think Matt has, has kind of said that too. It's really worth putting some time into writing your requests because that can be the frame, framework off which you then kind of have your discussions. And if you don't have a clinical question in mind for your, your scan request, then obviously, you know, ask your team. Um, for CT, the things are, that are important are obviously think ID, so make sure it's the right patient you know, outrule pregnancy where appropriate and have a look at their kidney function. Think about pre and post hydrating if needed. MRI, uh, previous brain or cardiac intervention, and particularly if there's any metal work in there um, and implants and foreign bodies, as we talked about. Um, I know a lot of you will be starting or have started um, your shadowing period now with F1. So do use this time um, to start making those discussions. And actually, if you, if you, particularly if you start your discussion with saying, I'm one of the incoming F1s, I'm just on my shadow and block. I just wanted to, to discuss a scan with you. Then um, I'm sure Matt will will agree that you know when when he's when he's back uh, vetting scans and having these discussions that that they'll all be very kind and you know support you in in in, in helping uh, getting along, getting these scans in. Yeah, absolutely. And that's pretty much it. So questions and answers this is just the qr code again back to this to this the slido if anyone has fallen out of it um and i guess to say that we've all been in in the position that you're now in and it is a little bit uh you know there's a bit of stress uh, associated with with starting out and all these different things that you have to remember but i think there's there's some really sensible kind of basic things that you can hopefully take from this and will help you as you as you start off in your for one year matt i don't know if you have any any comments while we wait for no, some absolutely. questions. I think, yeah, yeah, right. We've, we've all been at the stage that you are now and, and most people just want to help and, and make the experience as easy as possible. 
Um, certainly myself and, and all my colleagues that I know would be more, more than happy to help. And, and if you do have a particular interest in radiology, um, do come down to the department. I, I can't speak for every radiology department in the UK, but I'm sure, you know, if you take interest in, in our work and, and, and are thinking about a career in radiology, then get down to the department early, ask, ask the questions and, and get some experience. And, and I'm sure most people will be more than happy to help you out. Uh, it's a great career. Um, yeah, and best of luck. You, you'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. There's no specific radiology questions popping up in the Q&A at the moment. Somebody asking about dealing with uh, un unruly or kind of difficult other staff members, like, you know, as, as an F1 on the ward, it, it very rarely happens, I think, dealing with like, you know, other health professionals such as, you know, nurses and that. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I've, I've worked in multiple different capacities in, in the hospital, both as a radiographer and, uh, and a junior doctor now. I don't think that it's, it's necessarily, you know, been an issue for me along the way, but I think um trying to solve these issues always at the source is if, if there is any kind of um uh aggravation or that try and go and speak to the nurse themselves and obviously you know you have the support network as well between your your uh clinical supervisor and educational supervisor to have a chat with if there is any issues like that um yeah, no, absolutely um the vast majority of people most people are good and and yeah as you mentioned there i found during my fy1 year um nursing staff can be really really helpful and um, they they know how their ward works they know what's going on and and often they'll be the best person actually to if even if it's just little questions about how things happen on the ward day to day and um, some things that you might have not have been taught in, in induction the, the nursing staff are, are, are often brilliant and um, so yeah ask the nurses i think that's about it we will leave it there um so the email that was sent out from your registration has a link to the feedback, but again, I've just done another QR code here for you all to, to work on there. So thank you very much. And thanks very much to Matt, who's uh, on, on annual leave, but has, has come to join us and have this chat this evening. Hopefully it was useful for, uh, for you all. Um, I think Satch is not online. So I'm just going to stop sharing this for the moment and I'll just close out with the other slide. Thanks for having me. Thanks. No worries. We got there in the end. So yeah, again, IR Juniors and Mind the Bleep, um, very delighted to be working with them on this uh, this series, the two-part series. So the second one will be coming up as, as Sachin said. Um, irjuniors.com is the, the website for lots more information about uh, a career in interventional radiology if you want to get involved in research or any projects that we're doing. Um, plenty of other things as well. If you're particular interest in IR, I did, um, did a webinar series last year called Taste IR. The videos are still available on the on the the IRJ website there. So kind of different areas of IR that you might want to find out about. Um, we've got also got the applications masterclass that will obviously be relevant to the FY1s in about two years time. But if you want to get a head start, um, do tune into those. And we've got a journal club every uh, month as well with the British Society of Interventional Radiology. Um, so yeah, the second session will focus more on IR and getting patients down for IR procedures and what needs to be done before that. And this is Mind the Bleep. And so the 2nd of August is the second session. So do put that down in your, your calendar so you come along. And also the next journal club is on next Monday, the 26th. And it's looking at uh, selective internal radiation therapy um, for HCC. So thank you very much again. And thanks to Matt. And we'll leave it there. Uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.